Hello. Hello. One, two, three. Hello. Okay. Dr. Dan West. Hey, um, will you go tell him to turn his mic on and give me like a... Yeah. Can you turn your microphone on and then count to 10 for... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hi. Yes and no. To oh, some degree, we do. Thank you. Yeah. I, save that question for the end because I think you're. Good to go. Okay. Hi, everyone. All right. Hi, and welcome to the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. My name is Madison Miller, and I'm a winter naturalist here at ACES. Um, we're so excited to gather in person for speaker events after two years of remote talks. So thank you all so much for being here. We're very excited to see you. Naturalist Nights is a 10-week free speaker series in the Roaring Fork Valley, hosted by a partnership between Wilderness Workshop, the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, and Roaring Fork Audubon. Naturalist Nights talks are hosted every other week through mid-March in Carbondale at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays and at ACES here at Hallam Lake at 6 p.m. on Thursdays. I would like to thank our sponsors who make these events possible, a very special thank you to our featured sponsor, Reese Henry & Co. These businesses provide financial and in-kind donations, which cover travel expenses for our speakers and the cost of having Grassroots TV video the presentation, making Naturalist Nights possible. Grassroots TV airs presentations on Channel 12 in the Upper Valley and Channel 82 Down Valley. Videos will also be available on our organization's websites and social media feeds in the coming weeks. 
We also live stream each of the Naturalist Nights speakers on either Wednesday or Thursday evenings on both Wilderness Workshop and ACES Facebook pages. Next week's presentation will be Using Goats for Habitat Restoration on Public Lands with Hillary Boyd on February 24th here at Holland Lake. And now to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Dan West. Dr. West serves as the state's forest entomologist with the Colorado State Forest Service at Colorado State University. Dr. West conducts annual aerial surveys monitoring over 24 million acres of forested land in Colorado, which for context is an area greater than the entire state of Maine. He received his bachelor's in forestry and his master's and doctorate in entomology from Colorado State University. Previous to his role at the Colorado State Forest Service, he worked for the United States Forest Service and U.S. Geological Survey, surveying insect disturbances and ecological interactions within western forests suffering from bark beetle-caused mortality. Dr. West, thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, thank you for having me. Um, what an honor. I want to just start off by saying thank you to ACES, your partners, but really to all of you. And this is all possible because you guys um, are members and you attend here. So um, thank you. And I'm hoping I, I've, I've put together a bit of an ambitious um, agenda for the talk today. And I hope that some of this will come through OK. It's a little washed out, but that's OK. Um, I hope that as we kind of move through <clears throat> you get a perspective. I decided to kind of give us a, a perspective across the state um, because that's one where I serve is all of our state. But two, it's also kind of important to think about what's over the fence or what's over the mountain range and so that you can kind of see what's what's in and around your valley and around your home. So um, I hope that that kind of fits the bill. Is this not working? Here we go. So today I've decided to talk a little bit about some recent weather patterns and what that means for trees and bark beetles. Uh, what are bark beetles and how do they work? And then we'll kind of move into a little bit of the statewide highlights. I'll probably only have time to talk about bark beetles, but I'm hoping that maybe we'll have a little bit of time to talk about aspen issues and some caterpillars that feed on conifers, which are pretty cool. Um, and I have not really um, included a lot about management. There will be one slide at the end, but um, if that's kind of your interest, um, there's a lot of information that's out there. You can email me. My contact info is certainly here at the beginning, um, or maybe it's just at the end. Um, but feel free to um, reach out to me with phone calls or emails if you've got any questions. So let's get into it. Um, let's talk a little bit about the long-term temperatures, right? And why am I talking about that when we're talking about bark beetles? It will all come clean here at the end and throughout this talk. But I want to kind of mention what we're looking at here. Back to 1895 is the temperature record across the state of Colorado. This is from NOAA, so um, you, we can quabble about, you know, which is the most appropriate site to go to. But nonetheless, I kind of want to point out 1995 and forward, right? Kind of the last, you know, like we say, almost several decades. Um, and you can really start to see what's going on, right? We're really looking at this significant warming pattern. Um, we all hear about that. Um, you know, a degree here or there. If we zoom in on just the last few years, going back to 2000, if the mean temperature in the long-term average is somewhere around 44, which is about the baseline of this graph, you can really start to see the last few years are significantly warmer and we get this oscillation, right? There's a little bit of, you know, maybe two or three degrees, maybe four degrees oscillation from year to year, but nonetheless, we're warmer, right? You couple that up with, think about snowpack. Right. So many of us remember from, you know, thinking back the 2018, 2019 year, um, I chose to grab these numbers back at the beginning of May after all of the snowpack has kind of done what it's going to do and things are starting to melt. OK, so we're not accumulating any more snowpack um, just looking back at these. But 2018, 2019, a banner year. Right. We had snow, new slides, new shoots occur, occur across the state. We had avalanches that we hadn't seen in quite some time. Nonetheless, a banner year, right? What happened since then? You can see we were at, you know, down here in the southern part of Colorado. You can really start to see 200% of median. And then you notice up here at the top, you know, we're sitting somewhere right around average or somewhere close to the median values. Um, but then, you know, what happened? 2019, 2020 winter, the bottom fell out, right? Super dry, 
um, you know, we're looking at 30%, 42%, 50%, you know, significantly below. Then you go to 2020 to 21, same story, right? Significantly below snowpack averages. Um, and then, of course, where are we sitting today? Well, not quite today. I pulled this back in January 12th. So um, the numbers are probably a little bit greater now, but nonetheless, you can start to really see this pattern. If I click back a little bit and we look at this, right? Up in the northern reaches of the state, we're basically sitting right around median or average um, values for the last few years. And this will become important as we kind of move through some maps and we kind of build on this talk, you'll start to see a pattern develop across the state. TBD on what's going to happen this year, right? Um, but if we look at the long-term precipitation values, again, we're really looking at these oscillations back and forth, right? You really don't start to see this clear pattern like we see with temperature. And so what does that mean when we just zoom in on the last few years and we look at the last, you know, again, going back to 2000, you can really start to see, you know, just I just pulled the trend for the last five years. Now, granted, this past year, of course, is significantly um, altering that trend. But we're looking at a negative 11 inches per decade is the trend that we're kind of leaning towards right now. Right. So significantly drier and significantly warmer. Right. So when it gets that much warmer, that means that the environment is that much thirstier. It takes that much more precipitation to offset that temperature when we're thinking about trees. So keep that in the back of your brain as we kind of move forward. So what are bark beetles and how do they work? Bark beetles are the, a huge group of insects. Right. They're all part of the Coleoptera order. That's not super important, but think back to elementary school, right? So, okay, there's several orders of insects, but really what we're thinking about, this is the, the value that becomes super important, right? We've got a couple of subfamilies, not super important, but we got 215 genera that are just in the bark beetles alone. And then you think about, we're upwards of, we're almost approaching 600 species have been identified of bark beetles. And so just saying, oh, well, it's a bark beetle becomes a real challenge, right? There's so many of them. We've got a lot of insect um, cause mortality out there. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but bark beetles as a group utilize the vascular system and that phloem layer. And I'll talk about what that is um, in just a little bit. But remember, trees, they move their photosynthesis that they're producing carbohydrates through that phloem layer down to their roots. And we'll talk about that, what that means for bark beetles moving forward. Bark beetles are really in two primary um, categories. There's primary beetles and, and secondary beetles. Primary beetles are the bark beetles that attack and kill trees. Secondary beetles are the ones that are feeding on those trees after it's already dead. I kind of envision it to like a wildebeest and a lioness group taking down a wildebeest, right? The lions took down the wildebeest, but there's always turkey vultures and all kinds of hyenas and things that are feeding off of that, right? Same scenario with bark beetles, if you will. You know, the, the lioness took down the tree, but yet we've got all these other um, bottom feeders that are feeding off of that. And then there's a, a couple of functional feeding groups that I'm not really going to go into too much today, but um, ambrosia beetles are the beetles that are really important in tropical environments. Um, more of the bark beetles are more important for us in North America. And so I'll, I'll focus my efforts on that. I mentioned that there's, you know, 215 genera that are in, in the group of bark beetles, a huge group, but really I can boil it down to these four genera or these four genus of bark beetles. Dendroctinus, those of you that know Latin, translates to tree killer. That's where most of our primary uh, mortality comes from. We've got Ips, they're out there as well. I'll talk about those and, and where you can see that driving home. Dryocetes, we'll talk a little bit about that. That furry little guy is really cute. And then I'm not going to talk about scolitis today just for the sake of time. But just know that you can really start to boil these down into a small handful of, of um, categories. So how do you tell a bark beetle from somebody else, right? They're hard-bodied insects. They're stout, right? Think about it. They've got to live in that interface between the inner bark and the, and the wood itself, right? The wood proper. So you've got to be a pretty stout insect to be able to live in that environment and be able to feed through that bark and get down underneath. They're elongated. They're cylindrical. That's not super important. They're small. They're about one, one to nine millimeters in length. I'm going to pass around a box just so that you get a feel for what bark beetles look like. There's a couple of insects that are in here that may be on the right hand side or not what I'm going to talk about today. Those that are on the left side are kind of more what I'm going to talk about. Um, but it gives you an idea so that you can get a feel for what, what is the size of these things. 
But really from an entomological perspective, I'm looking at elbowed antenna with a terminal club. And that might not mean anything to you guys, but to me, that means a lot, right? Look at this club down here. This is where all the action is. Bark beetles can't see a whole lot. They have what are called omatidia, which are a million little cones. And so they don't see like you and I. They see shadows and they see light and dark in a million different, um, in fact, in this particular you know, instance, you might have a hundred different omatidia here. But nonetheless, they're basically a column where they can draw light into the eye. They're not seeing much in, in clarity. So they don't see very well. How they communicate is through chemistry. It's all about compounds, and I'll talk about that as we kind of move forward. But that terminal club can pick up one part per million in an ambient forest. And so that's how they're talking to one another, and that's how they're identifying trees that they're going to attack. And I'm not really going to mention too much about an elytra, but that's a trait that covers their wings. Think about it. They've got to live under the bark, right? And then they've got to fly to a new tree. So somehow they've got to be able to pull those wings out and fly, and they do that through these wing covers that are called elytra. And we use those as diagnostic tools. It's very difficult just using morphology for bark beetles. As you can tell, they're all really small. They've all got a club. They've all got an antenna with an elbow. And so it becomes real, a real challenge just looking at morphology alone. So we use trees as an aid to help us when we can. We use gallery patterns. And so galleries are these kind of etchings of bark beetles that occur in that inner bark layer, in that inner bark and xylem um, interface. And what do I mean by xylem, right? So think back on your, on your um, classes forever ago, right? The xylem is the wood proper. There's inner bark and outer bark. That inner bark is where trees are moving carbohydrates, and that's where bark beetles live. And I'll have a picture of that coming up here in just a little bit. And we also, I use geographical location as well, right? If somebody brings me an insect that says, hey, I was just in Thailand and I found this bug, I'm obviously going to know, oh, that's not from North America. But you'd be surprised at how many transfer between Mexico and the United States. And so we use that as an aid. And we have these geographical locations that depict where we're likely to find species. And of course, that's moving with climate, but um, it gives us a, a, an aid. This is just a picture of a couple of those galleries underneath there. So again, super important that we use these as, as diagnostic tools. These might not look like anything to you, but I can see that there's a nuptial chamber. A male was right here. A female took off, a female took off, and another female took off. So those are polygamous beetles. At any rate, I use those as diagnostic tools. And so when you're out there trying to figure out what is this bug, I would encourage you to cut off a little bit of bark or cut off a tree, part of the tree, a limb, something, so that we can use it as a diagnostic tool. But like in all of nature, in biology, right, it's not always, it's sometimes, right? Some beetles, like southern pine engraver, they just have a gallery that's really nondescript. It's a tiny little gallery that goes up the tree. They've got pupil chambers in it, which I'll talk about, but nothing real sexy or exciting about that. Same goes for Dendroctinus valens here in um, Colorado. They lay their eggs in a clutch, and those babies that hatch after about 10 days, they feed gregariously through the tree. And so there's really no, no gallery distinct that anybody can find. So again, um, just tools that I use and that you too can use as you're out walking through the forest. How do trees, um, how, how do bark beetles find the tree that they're going to attack? Well, really what we consider to be host selection and colonization is the process of identifying that tree that they can overcome the tree defenses, right? And now we're starting to get into, okay, there's an interplay between trees and bark beetles. And I'll talk about what that looks like, but it's really in two stages, right? It goes from primary host selection to secondary host selection. And that's all done through chemistry. The initial beetles that are going through the forest trying to find that first tree to attack, they're using these antennal clubs, keying in on tree compounds. When trees are stressed and water is below average, trees off put a suite of terpenes, they're 20 carbon compound chains, that basically smell. If you've ever walked up to a ponderosa pine and smelled it, you're smelling those 20 carbon compounds that are coming off of that tree. Well, bark beetles do that same thing, but they do it at a much better level, right? We've all heard that dogs can smell this amazing amount. Bark beetles are far better than a dog because they can pick up one part per million. So it's truly amazing. So bark beetles are flying through the forest and they're using that kind of tree smells to pick out the tree that's weakened. 
But not only that, they're also using an olfactory, their olfactory. They, they've got to, remember I told you, they don't fly very well and they don't see very well. So they're flying bumbling through the forest and they're trying to find that tree that has a weakened defense. And they're doing that based on the alcohols and these, these chirpings that are coming off of trees. They might, there's obviously some random searching that's going on, but there's also some kind of a gustatory acceptance that must occur. If you're a bark beetle and you're flying through the forest and you don't fly very well and you don't see very well, you're bound to run into a tree that's not the species for you, right? And when you do that, you bounce off, you fall to the bottom of the tree, you crawl up it a little bit and you start chewing on the bark. What needs to happen is they have to have enzymes to break down those defense compounds and those carbon, um, 20 chain carbon terpenes that are within trees, right? So if you're, let's just pick out a mountain pine beetle and you happen to land on a spruce, you don't have the enzymes to break that down to oxidize those compounds and turn that into a pheromone. And so what ends up happening, they chew on it, they're like, yuck, that's broccoli, right? I don't want that. And so then they basically take off and fly again. That process where they're finding that focus tree, that first tree that they're gonna go after, that's what we consider to be a pioneer beetle, or the, those are the ones that are first out there looking. Well, at some point they say, okay, yep, this is the tree that my body can process. I can turn all those into compounds. And again, that's a pheromone, just like you and I, if we didn't have perfumes and deodorant and everything else, right? We're putting off our, our pheromones. Beetles are doing the same thing, but they're doing that by eating the compounds within the tree. They're affixing hydrogen and oxygen compounds to those compounds that are from the tree. And out of the back end of them comes a, a suite of um, chemicals that we call a, a pheromone plume. That pheromone plume is in two stages, an aggregation and an anti-aggregation state. You wanna be able to draw all of your other buddies and all of your other what we call conspecifics, all of, if you're, let's say a spruce beetle, you wanna draw all other spruce beetle that are within the vicinity to this one tree because you wanna overcome the tree defenses, right? And so you're, you're calling them all in with chemical stimuli. I just use mountain pine beetle for this example, but this occurs for Doug fir beetle, spruce beetle, mountain pine beetle. There's many of them that we have ident identified, but as a beetle is flying through the forest and we're looking at this aggregation pheromone, they're chewing on the bark, they're oxidizing those terpenes, and then out the back end comes what we call transverbinol and ex exobrevicomin, right? Males and females are producing these compounds. Not super important that you understand the compounds, but what's important to note here is that males and females together are producing this pheromone plume that says everybody should attack this tree. Well, right at some point, you gotta turn that off, right? No vacancy here anymore, otherwise there's not enough food for your offspring. And so they do that also through chemistry. We call this an anti-aggregation pheromone. Together with mountain pine beetle, they're producing what's known as verbenone. And as the titer of that verbenone is increasing, it's sending the signal to incoming beetles Whoa, 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 we're starting to get too full. You need to go elsewhere. And so when you look out across the forest and you see this small grouping of trees, two, three, five, ten trees, it might be in a little small pocket. That's wise because there was one focus tree that they were all going for and then they showed up and this concentration of this anti-aggregation pheromone was too strong and they said, uh-oh, you gotta go somewhere else. So they're lazy, right? They're like, oh, well, I'm not gonna fly through all the way through the forest and get eaten by other beetles and bugs and other things. They say, well, I'll just go right to the tree next door. And so you kind of get this little small grouping of five to 10 trees. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So they get in there, what does it look like, right? Well, they've got to carve out a little spot where either the female and the male carve this spot out depending on, uh, upon the beetle species, but they've got to make a little bit of room inside that tree where two beetles can fit, right? That's what's called the nuptial chamber. I'm not gonna to talk too much about that, but that's basically just a beetle bedroom, right? That's where all the magic happens. The female then takes off and she starts to lay eggs. I don't know if you can see this, but there's a bark beetle in here. And then there's eggs that are laid along the side here. Okay, this is actually the male that's down here. What ends up happening is they mate. The female then takes off and starts excavating that phloem layer where all the carbohydrates are at. You wanna put your babies where there's food, right? You don't wanna put them somewhere where there isn't. And where there's food is in that phloem layer. And so at any rate, she lays a bunch of eggs, a clutch of eggs, somewhere between 60 and 150, depending upon the species. But they start to lay their eggs moving up that gallery. And then the male hangs out at that entrance hole for a little while. 
And he's hanging out there because he's making sure that no other male goes into that gallery and mates with her. They have um, specialized structures where they can um, swap sperm out, but they also want to make sure that no other predators get inside that gallery, right? That's your offspring. So you want to make sure, hey, I'm going to fight anybody to death that's coming in here because that's my babies that are in there. So at any rate, he hangs out for a little while and then eventually turns up this gallery and starts packing this sawdust that she has been making up against these eggs so that no predators can, can get to them. It takes about 10 days for the eggs to hatch, depending upon the species, give or take uh, 10 days or so. Um, and then the babies start to mine perpendicular to that first per, um, gallery that was created. Okay? And that's how trees basically end up suffering and suffocating themselves is because those babies are feeding perpendicular to the, how the tree grows, and eventually it basically cuts off all the carbohydrate movement within a tree, okay? <clears throat> they hatch, they get bigger. I'm not going to talk too much about what an instar is, but these, you, you'll recall back to elementary school, right? Insects that go through complete metamorphosis are insects that go through an egg, several larva stages, they go through pupa, and then they go to, into an adult stage. Well, that's what these are. Um, they pass the winter in the larva stage. And they do that by building up glycerins and, gl and glycols. And so what is glycerin, right? Well, glycerin's an antifreeze, right? So you think about it, they're building up in the fall time this huge storage of glycols to make it through the winter so that they can overcome this cold event that happens in the winter. At any rate, come, oh, springtime or so, May, they then start to burn off that glycol they complete their larval um, development. They go into a pupal state that occurs for about two or three weeks. That's really when they're most vulnerable. So they're just these tiny little pupa that are inside this little chamber down here. Um, and temperature swings really affect them during this time period. Think about it, you're going from a little grub to almost a complete adult, right? It's an amazing process if you really think about it. You're going from this little C-shaped grub to something that looks like a beetle is truly amazing, but I won't get into it too much. Um, but so at any rate, um, what happens on the outside? What do we see when we're walking through the forest? Or what do you see as you're walking through the forest or looking at your trees? Well, you might see what we call frass or boring dust, right? I'm not sure how well this comes through, but these are the shavings that have occurred after a bark beetle has gone down inside and starts to mine out that phloem layer. Remember, this frass or these shavings are filled up with that pheromone plume, right? They're eating those terpenes. Out of the back end of them comes this pheromone um, suite of, of chemicals, but it's also impregnated into this frass. And that becomes important when you really start to think about trees that can make pitch tubes. And those are the trees that have a dense amount of resin ducts that are on the outside of them. I'll have a graphic of this here in a second. But think about it, if this is filled up with a way that bark beetles can communicate, if you can keep all of that internally or you can keep it on the edge of, of the bark, bark beetles can't communicate, right? And so that's what you wanna try to do. Well, think about it in years where there isn't a lot of precipitation, there's below average precipitation, there isn't as much resin, which means that there isn't as much of this production that occurs, and so bark beetles can communicate more freely. What else do we see? Woodpecker foraging, you know, downy woodpecker, hairy woodpecker, the two that most prevalent we see, but there's um, others, red-bellied, there's yellow-bellied, there's the red-naped ladderbacks. There's several other kind of woodpeckers. I'm sure several in here can um, talk about that a little bit more than I can, but what about foliage, right? Oftentimes when you're driving down the, fo down, you know, any of them, 82 or any of the other um, roads in Colorado, you can look up in the forest and you can see these red trees, right? Trees turn red because remember their larvae are feeding across that phloem layer, which is the carbohydrate layer, and trees can no longer replace the water and they can no longer replace those sugars that they're producing um, for photosynthesis. So at any rate, they then start to turn red. And then after it's all said and done, anybody that's a bird hunter has gone bird hunting or has seen a, a shotgun, you basically know what, what bird shot looks like. That's what happens on the outside of these trees. You get these tiny little pinholes from the adults that have emerged. So as they go in, you get pitch tubes or you get sawdust. As they come out, you don't get anything. You just get a tiny little hole. And so you can start to determine, well, oh, is this an older tree or is this a tree that's just been attacked and maybe we've got babies inside? What about blue stain, right? We've all heard about, oh, you're going to put blue stain on your floor. Or you're going to put blue stain in your kitchen, right? What does that mean, right? Well, these bark beetles are amazing because 
I'll just kind of draw your attention to the scanning electron micrograph photo right down here. This is one hair on these bark beetles. Look at what happens underneath that hair. This is a pit, right? Are there any mycologists in the group? Does anybody know what any of these are? They're fungal spores, right? And so these bark beetles are amazing. They have these structures that are called mycangia, where they're picking up these fungal spores and they're bringing them with them. And why would they do that? Well, historically, the theory was is that they only had these fungi that are part of the ascomycetes that are the staining fungi. They bring those with them because it starts to break down that xylem material and that wood proper. Well, they could then turn that into a food resource for their offspring. But fungi have also evolved as well. And now they've got deleterious fungi that they're also bringing that bark beetles can't discern. They're picking up the dirty and the good with them and they're bringing it with them throughout the trees. This is a, another amazing photo. This is the mandible. I don't know if you can tell, this is a bark beetle that's on its back. It's like a turtle on its back, right? It can't really do anything. These are mites, so small little mites. And this is the tooth, which is right here. You can see at the bottom of that tooth, they also have these mycangia that are filled with these fungal spores. So truly amazing when you start to think about the, um, it's, it's really like a, a true um, ecosystem underneath the bark, basically because these bark beetles are bringing it with them. At any rate, um, if you ask a mycologist or a pathologist, you know, well, it's the fungi that's killing the tree. If you ask an entomologist, it's really the bark beetle that's killing the tree. It's somewhere in between. You know, um, if we really think about how trees work, and I'll talk about this here in a second, but there's really only a couple places that fungi can move within a tree. So they're plugging up some of that water movement and living tissue, as well as the bark beetles are severing that, that layer where they move carbohydrates. So what kills bark beetles out there? So this is a, a beetle, a predator beetle, that's feeding on a bark beetle. It has decapitated this Ips beetle. The head's gone. And so this is adult beetle on adult beetle action, right? Well, if you look down here, that same beetle lays eggs at the entrance of a bark beetle. And so this is the larva of that beetle that's now on larva on larva, right? So truly amazing when you start to parse this all out of like, they're not just sitting ducks. I mean, you know, trees have an amazing amount of um, things working in their favor, not to mention woodpeckers as well, right? We used to think that woodpeckers would pick off about 10%, somewhere between five and 10% of beetle populations every year. We really don't see that if you think about some of the exponential growth curves and thinking about the K factor of how long it takes for some of these woodpeckers to really catch up in their population. There's such a, a lag that you, it's really several years and maybe in our parents' generation or grandparents' generation, you know, they would be able to catch up quick enough. But anymore, we have so many bark beetles that the lag is so great that there really is no impact from woodpeckers or very little. So I've mentioned about resins and I've talked about that a little bit. Um, resin is the primary defense of a tree, right? Against bark beetles, that is. It's a mechanical defense. So what does that mean, right? it serves to flush out that wound when a bark beetle is trying to get into it, right? If I'm a tree and I'm sitting up, you know, I'm standing here just under my clothes, you can envision a series of garden hoses that wrap around me that are filled with resin. Okay, if something were to try to get down inside of me to my torso, they've got to eat through my clothes, then eat through those garden hoses that are filled up with resin in order to get down inside, right? Well, once they sever those garden hoses, what happens? Well, there's turgor pressure, right? So pressure within a tree. And so that resin then starts to ooze out. And hopefully if there's enough resin, it flushes that wound. It doesn't only just flush them in theory, but it also has some antimicrobial activities as well. So there's compounds within the tree that serve as this antibacterial and, and antifungal properties. So it's also a chemical constituent. And not only that, but we know that inside, let's say a lodgepole pine, it has toxic chemicals in the resin that are only toxic to bark beetles. And so they have evolved to turn these defensive compounds into a way to kill these bark beetles. And it's just like you and I, right? Our, your um, you know, system might be slightly more depressed than mine. Trees are very much this way. I've done a resin study where two trees side by side have completely different amounts of compounds within them, 
And so it becomes really important when you really start to think about a bark beetle flying through a forest and choosing that particular tree. They've not only got to get through the bark, but they've got to overcome this chemical warfare that trees are throwing at them. This is just to remind folks, this is what it looks like. If this is the inside of a tree, the pith, you've got annual growth rings, right? I've talked about wood proper or xylem. That's where the annual growth rings are at. This little layer of phloem is really what I'm talking about. I'm gonna pass around a little sample of what um, bark, inner and outer bark looks like. This is from a Douglas fir from 1981. But you can kind of envision this tiny little layer where bark beetles are feeding. That's the phloem layer that they're feeding in. And so it becomes important again when you're thinking about, well, how do trees grow, right? They're splitting this vascular cambium both tangentially and longitudinally to get bigger around and taller, right? Well, they wanna protect that. And so how do they protect that annual ring? They do that with what I call our garden hoses or our resin ducts. Okay, so if I'm a bark beetle and I've got to get down inside of that phloem layer, I've got to penetrate that bark and get down inside those resin ducts and, and get down inside to the phloem layer. So when there's not enough precipitation and we've got warm temperatures where trees are off putting a lot of water by opening up stomates and, and you know, photo, processing photosynthesis, They've got to supplement that water somehow, right? Well, what ends up happening is they shut down their stomates and say, gosh, I can't open up and exchange as much gas as I want. And so they're drawing on those reserves of the resin ducts, okay? And so you can envision it, those are the times when they're most vulnerable. Bark beetles have to get through those, those what I call garden hoses or resin ducts, right? And so they're swimming back and forth. If, if you're bored and you want to just see nature at its best, Sit down and watch a bark beetle work. They go inside the tree, they come back out, and they're swimming in this resin, pushing it all back out. And remember, it's full of toxins. So their, their name of the game is to get in there as quick as they can, get that resin pushed out, and get back in there. Keep going and going and going until those resin ducts, the garden hoses are depleted. And then it takes about seven days for a tree to turn that back on. And so it takes a while for trees to respond to that attack. And so within seven days, if you've put out enough chemical to say, hey, everybody, this is the tree we want to overcome, the tree doesn't have enough chance to then turn on enough resin, get themselves built back up and defend themselves. And so that's kind of the process by which it works. Which trees are most susceptible? Well, we really think about size, right? I've already mentioned they love phloem. So what do they get when they get phloem thickness? They get bigger trees. So really the largest trees are the most susceptible that we see out in our forest. Bark beetles love dense forests. I've already mentioned that they can't see very well and they can't fly very well. So imagine if you're at the buffet, right? It's one thing after another. You don't have to go very far, right? You don't have to worry about your food source because it's all right there. But if we can alter that and change that with certain species that are growing within the forest and we can change some of that age diversity that's in there, we can then build in some resiliency and we can make it more difficult for bark beetles. And that's what we do as foresters. Of course, drought, that's what it's all about. We'll talk about that. Um, as we kind of move through some of the maps. Some of the root diseases, mistletoe, some of the other maladies, humans chopping into trees in, in, in campgrounds and parking lots, all of the things that would predispose a tree are the really the big factors that we think about, right? But in sum, it's all about tree vigor. How well is that tree producing and growing is what it's all about. And I often get the question, why don't we just get rid of bark beetles? Why don't we just kill them? And we can do that, right? We can do that with aerial applications. We can do that in a, in a lot of different ways. But we don't wanna do that because these are the ecological sanitizers of the forest. These are the ones that first start the nutrient cycling. They're bringing in those blue staining fungi that then starts to break down the wood. The tree then topples over and we really start to build up an ecosystem in nutrient cycling. And so we don't wanna get rid of them. They influence and drive our forest structure. They create openings. They then create a change in microhabitat, right? So we get age diversity and species diversity with bark beetles that are in there. So we don't wanna get rid of them or we're gonna be in even worse shape. They create wildlife habitat through snags and downed logs. Think about all the little critters that live off of those little downed logs that are in the forest, as well as all the songbirds and cavity nesting birds that use um, you know, snags. But really, this is what it's all about in Colorado, right? Water yields. And so we've learned that since mountain pine beetle came through in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we've learned that the snowpack is coming off two, maybe three weeks earlier 
because we no longer have that canopy that's keeping solar radiation from hitting the snowpack. And so that becomes important, right? When we really start to think about water retention and capture and water quality, we now got to think about a longer period of time, not to mention what happens with fire, right? If snowpack is coming off two or three weeks earlier, what happens? That's two or three weeks earlier that grasses and the understory is curing out, which means that then you've got that much longer of a fire season. So it really starts to weave together when you start thinking about bark beetles can equate to, you know, larger, more intense fires as well as water quality. We also know that there's little evidence or scientific evidence to show that there's more fire where bark beetles occur. But we know that when there are fires that occur where there have been bark beetles, the intensity is much greater. The fire effects are that much worse, which means that those fires are more difficult to suppress. You can't suppress them anymore with just hand crews like maybe our parents or our grandparents' generations used to do. And we also have learned now in the last just couple of decades that some species like Doug fir beetle and spruce beetle, mountain pine beetle, some of these major dendrochinus species, they thrive on those trees that have been moderately scorched, which maybe our parents' generation published that, oh, those trees are never attacked, but that's not what we see today. So it becomes a real um, interesting story when we start thinking about where is our climate affecting our bark beetles and how are fires affecting our bark beetles and the inverse. Let's talk a little bit about some specific bark beetles statewide and what does that look like? Um, the data that I'm going to show comes from aerial survey. Um, aerial survey is basically um, trained observers sit in small aircraft and we look out the window and we have a tablet sitting in our lap. We have specialized software that basically shows us where we are on the planet and then we start to draw circles around dead trees. And we not only just draw circles, but we're saying, hey, that's a spruce or that's an Engelmann spruce or that's a blue spruce. And that's likely from Ips beetle or that's likely from a Dendroctinus or that's likely from mountain pine beetle. We're flying about 500 feet to 2,000 feet above ground level. That's what AGL stands for. So we're not super high, but we're not super low. You know, we're just, a, you know, 500 feet off the deck is super close. We're flying super fast, about 115 miles an hour. So if you're only 500 feet off the forest and you're going 115 miles an hour, you're working feverishly quick. The goal of aerial survey is not to determine Mrs. Smith's apple tree or Mrs. Smith's spruce. The goal is really to look up a drainage and say, uh oh, we've got something that's going on here. Can we then start to act on that on the ground? And then can we put in some plots and start to look at things? We're monitoring 3.3 square miles per minute. We have 24 million forested acres in the state of Colorado that we're capturing every single year, looking at every single acre from an aircraft. And that's just the first line of defense. How do we do that? Right? So we've got a lot of steep terrain. How do you stay 500 feet above ground level? Well, basically, we have these awesome pilots that fly up each drainage. They make right-hand turns, which pilots don't like to do when you're staring at a big granite wall in front of you, right? They want to turn to the left so that they can see what they're doing, but instead they're making right-hand turns for us so that I'm sitting in the co-pilot seat and I'm looking out the window and I'm documenting what's happening. And that happens throughout our entire forest over and over and over and over. This picture is of the collegiate peaks, but um, nonetheless, there are some flatter terrain areas in the northern part of Colorado, certainly in some areas um, in, you know, some other parts of Colorado that are more flat terrain um, where we fly grids, where we've got two people, one person sitting behind the pilot and one person sitting in the co-pilot. Not super important, but this is kind of what I wanted to get to is some of the spruce beetle, Doug fir beetle, western balsam bark beetle that, that's occurring out on the landscape. You can kind of pick through here, right? Spruce beetle, look, look around us, right? Gunnison, Hinsdale, you know, looking just kind of uh, Chafee County, just looking over the hill, you can kind of see what's happening, right? These are some of the worst offenders or the counties that are most affected. Look at Doug fir beetle, uh-oh. And not only that, but then you've got Gunnison, you've got Garfield, you've got Eagle, you've got so many counties that are all right here, right? not to mention Western balsam bark beetle. So let's get to this a little bit. This is what the statewide map looks like, not super important. This is what it looks like in 2021, but then let's look and see what did it look like in 2019? Eh, not super exciting, but you can all of a sudden, not that we can discern some of these colors, these two look exactly the same, but um, nonetheless, if you go to some of these story maps that we have in some other locations, you can type in your address, you can type in counties, you can search these, um, but nonetheless, you can kind of see that we're starting to see some changes across the landscape. I put 2019 on here because in 2020, we didn't fly all of the state of, of Colorado because of COVID protocols. So um, a lot of these comparisons I'm gonna make to 2019. 
So what spruce beetle? Look at how sexy this thing is. It's a beautiful beetle. It's part of the dendroctinus genus. Again, tree killer, right? It takes two years to produce a life cycle, which is pretty important, right? Think about where it's growing. The growing season is incredibly short at the highest spruce fir elevations. And so it's a really small window in time when they can develop. And so it takes two years for them to get going. But they are uh, masters at utilizing these avalanches and wind throws. And why would they do that? Well, they do that because think about it, they're at the highest elevations and when wind can move a, an amazing amount or, or avalanches can move an amazing amount of this wood to the ground, then they can use that insulative layer of snow and they can avoid some of those extreme severe cold temperatures. They fly in June and July. I'm not gonna belabor this part too much for the sake of time, but they produce eggs. They get bigger as larvae. They eventually turn into pupa and they turn into adults. <clears throat> Again, this is what maybe a, a wind throw event might look like from the air. This is at Mount Evans. Um, but nonetheless, the interesting thing about spruce beetle is that, would you think that this forest, and I know the colors are a little bit um, skewed, but you, know, you wouldn't think that this forest is affected at all until you really start to get in there. And you start to see that bark beetles have completely stripped some of these trees. And then you get a little bit closer and you're like, man, those, those trees are green. And so it becomes interesting with spruce beetle because you really don't see the effects until maybe a year later. And by then they've already flown the ship. They're somewhere else. So it becomes a challenge. When we think about acreage across Colorado, we're sitting at about 1.9 million forested acres that have been affected, cumulative acres that have been affected. But really, you can see the last seven years, we're you know, really dipping down. And we're kind of at the right tail of the bell-shaped curve, right? And we hope that that continues. But part of that is because they've eaten themselves out of house and home. And we'll see that bear out here. Those of you that lived here through the mountain pine beetle epidemic, right? In comparison, this is what we're looking at. Spruce beetle has affected about 42% of our spruce fir forest in Colorado. Mountain pine beetle affected about 81% of our pine forests. And so it's really a one-two punch when you think about back to 1996 when mountain pine beetle was building, it started to die off when spruce beetle was like, yeah, I'm going to take off. And so it's been this one-two punch of um, trying to manage bark beetles across the landscape. I'm a visual learner and I know we're getting short on time, so I'm gonna go through this pretty quick, but I just brought this back to 2001. You can kind of see up here in the Route National Forest by Steamboat, that's kind of when we first started to see spruce beetle really start to pick up. 2002, it's getting stronger, 2003 more so. Uh oh, 2004, now we've got something, right? If we go back and we think about the precipitation and temperature maps, what happened in 2002, 2003? fire and super drought years, right? So now all of a sudden we got bark beetles that are like, yeah, buddy, I don't have any tree defenses to worry about and I can really start to build up my populations quickly. So 2005, 2006, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and then here we are in 2021. And so you can kind of see, right? We started in the Rio Grande down here, and now all of a sudden we're through the West Elks, we're now into the Sawatch Range and into the Mosquito Range, right? So we're really starting to kind of engulf the Roaring Fork Valley now. And you notice up in the top, right? It moved from the route all the way over to the Medbow, down and through the Arapaho, and now we're starting to move into here. If we look at the beetle intensity polygons, and I don't know how well this shows up, but a lot of them aren't in these bright red categories. They're kind of in these moderate intensity polygons, right? Where we're seeing, yeah, they're here, they're strong, but they're not just all the way gangbusters as far as we can see. And if we kind of do that one step further and say, okay, if we look and see at the intensity and then we throw on there where where has spruce beetle not been, we can really start to figure out where's it going. And that's what this map really depicts. This is areas of intensity. If I take it one step further and say, well, where are the new areas where it hasn't been found last year or before? This is what this map looks like. And I don't know how well this comes across, but you can basically see the heart of Colorado, right? We're sitting dead in the bullseye where we sit today. And so as temperatures increase and precipitation wanes or just is actually at a negative 11 per decade, inches per decade, we're really setting ourselves up for this, uh-oh, we're not going anywhere, it's gonna get it worse. Maybe some oohs and ahs, Rocky Mountain National Park, um, near Creed in the Rio Grande, but um, nonetheless, I didn't include a whole bunch. I just wanted to mention, uh, in contrast, mountain pine beetle, 
it can produce a generation in one year. And if you really think about it, it produces pitch tubes, same kind of life cycle. I'm not going to go too much into that. It produces these really bright red trees. If we kind of start this one back to 1996 and look at what it did, right? So here we are, 1996, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. What happened in 2013 on the front range? Anybody remember? biblical floods, right? Or whatever they called the hundred year flood that occurred on the front range, right? So that was in 2013. So you can kind of see what happened. Boom, 2014, it basically just goes away. Wow. Water turns on, bark beetle goes away. Wow. This is where we sit today. We've got some, just looking over the, over the fence here, Gunnison has Taylor Park. We just harvested about 600 acres out of there. Um, we're gonna continue to work in that area to, to reduce populations. In the Mosquito Range, so in the Chafee County, so just on the other side of Buena Vista, we've got a little pocket that's really been building. So Crested Butte, Taylor Drainage, and really this area in the Mosquito Range are the two that are closest to home where we sit today. Doug Fir Beetle, another one, prefers large diameter trees, older trees. Well, what does that mean, trees older than 120 years? Anybody who studies fire, right? What happened in 1850 and 1880? Right? Those are the big wildfires that occurred where most of our trees arose from. So really all of our trees are sitting in this high susceptible category when you think about it. I'm not going to talk about volume. All of our forests are greater than 150 square feet per acre. And that's all in part because in 1937, the U.S. Forest Service instilled um, the 10 a.m. rule. And so it, it, that's a rule that started at 10 a.m. We want all fires out that were burning the day before by 10 a.m. And that completely changed the landscape that we see today. This flight is also super important for Doug Fir. It starts in May and goes all the way into August, the longest that we have, right? So it's a really long period that adults are out there. There's no pitch tube, so it doesn't really have a chance to kind of engulf some of that chemistry that the beetles are creating. And not only that, but their galleries are really distinct. Um, that we can certainly use, but it, every year it needs to find a new tree and complete its life cycle. And so it can build populations incredibly quick. It first starts out in these little focal trees or little groups of, what is this, eight trees or nine trees here. What we want to avoid, and I don't know how well this comes across, but what we want to avoid is those little pockets that start to coalesce into the whole hillside. And really, once we start to look at the map, this is what the map looks like. What do we see right here in the Roaring Fork Valley, right? kind of doom and gloom, right? When you think about I threw on the last four years on top of that as well, what do we got? A whole bunch of activity all right here. And that kind of starts to show us that, uh-oh. If I zoom in a little bit, I made this last year red, or I guess that's kind of a brownish color that we're seeing. So you can start to discern what was this past year and what was years before, right? Well, the frying pan's got it going on, right? Well, what about where we sit today, right? Uh-oh, no, all of a sudden we start to see a lot of activity. And so what we've seen is about 180% increase over the last five years, just right here down in the Roaring Fork Valley. And so that kind of triggers us when we start to think about, well, what about the fires that have occurred? We also now got this, not only do we have dry, warm conditions, but now we've got these moderately scorched trees that can really start to build up and harbor bark beetles and, and create a population that can then start to affect adjacent, otherwise healthy stands. And that's where we sit today. Again, you zoom in, this is really what we're looking at, kind of the worst case scenario right here. We don't wanna see that on the hillside. And so I'm now, we are now starting to work with ACES and other groups um, to really start to figure out what can we do and can we use some of this chemistry against some of the bark beetles um, so that we're not putting insecticides out in the forest. At any rate, more of that to come in the future. I've got a few more slides on bark beetles, but I think we're getting close to time here. Um, I want to save a little bit of time for, for conversation. I'll just mention Western balsam bark beetle that's out there. It's kind of a sexy bark beetle because of its haircut, right? It's a furry little girl and guy, but females have this cute little tuft of hair on the front. I think they're pretty sexy, but they're really small little bark beetles. They affect subalpine fur. And so what's really important when you think about some of this, right? Subalpine fir, these pointy little trees that are out there, but they're the real bright red ones that you see when you're driving down um, looking at the forest. 
<clears throat> this is what the um, you know, state of the state looked like in 2019. I'll draw your attention not only to you know, what we see in kind of Gunnison County, Chafee County, Pitkin County, but also what we see in the flat tops, right? Look at what happens, boom, 2021, all of a sudden we've got it everywhere. And so we're really starting to see if you match up these maps that I've kind of been showing with those drought maps and the precipitation maps, you really start to notice that these areas that are up in the north have really received a lot less bark beetle activity than what some of these southern reaches have, have seen. Subalpine fir is also being attacked by a non-native pest as well, and I won't mention this too much, but I'm starting to work in some of these areas in Colorado to identify, are these native bark beetles that are killing trees or do we see something else? These guys came from Asia. I won't mention round-headed pine beetle, just it's a cool story because it occurs down in the south part of Colorado. It's got a cool climate change story. If you want more of that, you can um, try to do some, I, I think several of my talks are online, you can see some of that, but that population built up when we were again in these extreme and severe drought conditions in 2012, 2013. You can kind of see this is where we're looking. If you don't know where Dolores County is, it's kind of down here tucked away in the southwest corner. You can kind of see in 2012, this is where we were sitting, right? A pretty dry year. Lots of fires occurred there, but look at 2013, a really dry year. Then all of a sudden, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. It kind of started to eat itself out of house and home. If you throw them all together, this is the barf map that you get, right? Lots of mortality. <clears throat> this past year, not only did we see this, but now all of a sudden, uh-oh, now we've got more up north. So again, you know, it's kind of a good time to be a, a forest entomologist, but a really bad time to be a forest, right? We need precipitation really badly to offset that thirstier environment that we've got. Although it looks nuclear here, this is what it looked like in 2016. This is the dead center. This is a drainage. This is from an aircraft. But you can kind of see out here is definitely the periphery or the margin where trees are dead. Look out here in the forest. That's where I'm worried about, right? Look at in 2018. Again, a lot of those trees are dead, but look in the forest. That's where I'm worried about, right? 2019, I don't know how well you can see this, but lots of those pockets started to get bigger. And here's the dead spot that I was showing earlier. This is what it looks like currently. Miles and miles. So much so that Montrose Forest Products, which is a mill in Montrose, spent $20 million to retool their mill so they can start to process ponderosa pine. At any rate, pinion nips is out there. I'm, I'm not going to belabor this too much. Um, I'm going to move forward, um, if I can, a little bit and just kind of talk a little bit about management and what we're doing. In short, so if you ever want to hear about caterpillars that have spinnerets in their mouth and spin their way down out of a tree and then repel to an adjacent tree, I mean, right? Like spiders do that, not caterpillars. But at any rate, um, I, I'd be happy to talk about that. But at any rate, we've got aspen maladies and other things that are out there. Um, but really what I, what I want to talk about is that in order to deal with bark beetles, you've got to figure out where they are right? You can't think about a forest. Just think about as you're skiing or as you're looking up the hillsides. It's immense. And so you got to sit in aircraft and you got to do some remote sensing to figure out, well, where is it occurring? And then where has it been and where is it likely to move to? And we do that using aerial photography in some instances. It's slow, it's expensive, but it's really accurate. Some of us sit in aircraft, right? We're cheap and fast, but we're not super accurate but we're trying to get a, a ballpark figure of where do we have issues and then can we get on the ground and get our boots going. We use chemistry and right, so pheromone traps. We use the chemistry against bark beetles and how they communicate to say, uh-oh, you need to go somewhere else or, oh, we're gonna draw you in here and then we're gonna cut those trees and burn them or move them. And then of course, ground sampling, right? We wanna look at things on the ground. I'll leave it at the management summary. There's a lot of kind of tools in the tool bag, the right tool for the right job. And that's really my job is to manage up, you know, and pair up the management activities with the biology of the bark beetle. We don't want to use an anti-aggregate pheromone that works on mountain pine beetle when we have Douglas fir beetle that are, that's killing trees because they don't work. So you really got to kind of know your tree species. You got to know your bark beetles that are out there and then marry up the management for that. With that, I'm going to leave it. Um, I hope that there's some questions. And I just want to say thank you very much for having me here.
Um, so we have a few moments for questions. Um, I'll come around with the microphone. Um, and just so you know, the microphone's not projecting in this room. It's just for the camera. Uh, so you will have to speak loud enough so Dr. West can hear you. But does anyone have questions? I know it's been two years since we gathered, but fire them away. <laughs> no shame here. The question was, how does Colorado f fare with other states? And, and the short answer of that is, I pair up with New Mexico and Arizona and Utah and, and Wyoming, and we all kind of work on these things together. And as goes precipitation and temperature, so goes our tree defenses and our, and our tree susceptibility. It's really a, a regional thing that we're dealing with right now. Some species are far worse than others. Pinion and junipers have really taken it in the shorts. And that's a tree species that's adapted to almost no water and really warm temperatures. But because we've got these really late warm periods and then it drops off and gets super cold, that's more impactful than some of these bark beetles. And then the bark beetles can move in and take those trees out. And so how do we fare? We're really all in the same boat when we really think about it. Um, you know, maybe if we parse it out and say, well, how's the Roaring Fork Valley compared to the rest of the state? And I'd say right now, you're really good, but it all is dependent. We see the storm and the wave that's coming, right? And so we want to act now. Yeah. You mentioned uh, uh, biblical boulder floods of 2013. Yeah. On a smaller scale, like a 45 minute thunderstorm, uh, would that rejuvenate the forest enough to fight off the beetles? Great question. Did you guys hear that? So yeah, okay, yeah. So. The question is really around, uh, will a 45 minute storm or, or small blips in precipitation kind of stem the tide? And the, and the short answer is no. Um, trees really um, take up most of their water from overwinter um, precipitation. So we know in February and March, that's when they're building up most of their reserves and building some of those resin ducts. But really, all those summertime storms do is they offset the transpiration. So I won't get too heavy into it, but when trees are photosynthesizing, they've got to open up their stomates to exchange gas. And when they do that, water escapes. Well, remember, we're warmer, right? So we have a longer growing season than we ever have. And so trees are really thirstier than they ever have been. It takes about two years of adequate or above average precipitation for trees to be able to then grow those fine feeder roots and recapture some of that precipitation that occurs. So the summertime temperatures are really just kind of, they're not hurting by any means, they're helping, but they're not the bulk of what's driving our, our drought and our tree defenses. Great question. Um, well, when the pine beetle first came here, we always thought it was because we weren't um, getting below zero temperatures in the winter. If we start getting lower temperatures, will that help? Absolutely. So what I think of being critical, so there's what's called the supercooling temperature, and that's the temperature at which the fluids inside a bark beetle turn to crystal. It's a one-time temperature, and basically they turn, they freeze. Okay, that, they have to overcome those glycerins that they're building and glycols that they're building up, right? It, think about with mountain pine beetle. Mountain pine beetle can withstand a negative 35 below zero, that's under the bark temperature, before we start to see any mortality occur. Think about when was the last time that happened? In Colorado, I can tell you when that was. That was in 1986. And we haven't seen temperatures even come close to that since then. So we used to consider about 10 to 20% overwinter cold mortality in bark beetles. That is no longer part of my algorithm when I think about where are bark beetles going and, and what, what percentage of the population are we likely to see die off. I don't calculate uh, uh, temperatures anymore. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. If we've got time. Yeah, sorry. Any last questions? Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm here. So cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I'm wondering when we look at these huge patches of forest that are having bark beetle mortality, what we might expect to come subsequently in those places. Like, would it regenerate to the same kind of stand or something really different? And, like, do we have models from paleoecology or just from the recent past of that happening? Great question. Yep. So, there's some models by Rayfield and other people um, that kind of talk about vegetation models based on a changing climate. 
And when we pair that up with where are we likely to see, let's just use lodgepole pine as an example, right? Lodgepole pine is partially serotonous in their cones, right? Which means that they have to have fire to regenerate. And so when we think about, okay, well, a bark beetle might move through and completely take out a, a portion of the overstory. Well, some solar radiation is going to open up some of those cones. And so bark beetles are brilliant in that they like the largest trees. They leave those small trees for their grandchildren, right? They're not going for a tree that's two inches or one inch or, or four inches. They want the granddaddy, right? They want the big thick phloem so I can produce as many offspring as I can. So really they're smart. They're leaving trees for the next generation of beetles to come through. And what we've seen, we were, Maddie and I were talking about, there are people that are doing sediment cores in lakes and we're able to identify when were there past bark beetle outbreaks and do we still see forest there? And we do. And so what we really see is that we're starting to see Douglas fir in islands that are maybe less important, that are in the lower elevations where we're maybe managing and saying, we're unlikely to get regeneration from Douglas fir here again but we are likely to get aspen and we are likely to get other species that are more adapted. And so from a management perspective, we're taking that into consideration, but yes, we're likely to still see the force that we see today based on um, bark beetles because of their desire for the thickest phloem. Yeah, cool. great question. If we've got time, let's keep it rolling. I, I, I mean, I don't know um, if, we've, if we don't, we can wrap up and, and I'll just hang out and chat. Um, yeah, we can do a couple more. Yeah, by all means. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll get back yeah. there. I'm how staying does, around, no worries. How does uh, fire affect the research that you do and the future research that you do on pine beetles and the study plots that you guys uh, create? Great question. So if you didn't hear it, how does fire affect research and how does fire affect some of the bark beetle um, work that I do? And, and it's kind of twofold, right? Um, I want to see forest regeneration. And so um, when I look through stands and I, I, I'm kind of, you know, the, I show up when there's problems, right? And so I want to see the forest regenerate and I want to see um, kind of a nutrient cycling occur but I don't wanna see all of my plots and long-term plots that are um, kind of lost in that. And so that does happen. Um, we certainly have traps and we have long-term plots where we're identifying tree fall rates and we're looking at um, some of the kind of regeneration that comes in after lodgepole pine and, and what is the amount of regeneration that comes in. Some of that's just lost. And um, I chalk it up to that's part of science, right? Um, and hopefully we've got enough power in the, in the sample locations that we've got to overcome some of that. But, it's part of the game, um, yeah. And you know, when you think about fires like the Lake Christine fire that are tremendously hot in some areas and not so much in others, it just opens up another opportunity to say, hey, maybe we lost some areas up here, but we can also kind of gain some other areas and look at some of the moderately scorched areas and kind of look at the fire severity and how is it affecting the long-term trajectory of bark beetles and, and forests. So yeah, great question. It's all interconnected. It's, I, I really can't parse it out. I'm really lucky that I you know, did my studies on, um, my master's was in fire um, after bark beetles and then um, my PhD was really after host selection and how do beetles um, choose this tree over that tree and the chemistry and, and looking at some of the carbohydrates and fats and lipids within bark beetles. And so I kind of got to see both sides of the forestry aspect, um, which I'm, I'm really fortunate. Keep them coming. Uh, I noticed on the management slide you had mentioned ski slopes and as a community surrounded by ski slopes and proposing expanding our ski slopes, I was wondering how that plays into the management of bark beetles. Uh, so if everybody didn't hear, the question was around ski slopes and how do we manage for bark beetles in and around ski areas? Um, that maybe you might want to open up terrain or maybe you don't. And so um, really the goal is to work with us, right? I mean, we get our um, intrinsic values and some of the values that we get out of forestry um, from the services that the forest provides. And so it's really kind of a give and take, right? I mean, skiers often want bark beetles because think about up on Steamboat Mountain, right? When Mountain Pine Beetle came through, we were there, right? We were seeing it firsthand and we were cutting trees down to say, man, all of these trees are infested. The skiers are like, woohoo, like the new terrain. 
But yet, you know, when you look on the hillside now, it's almost barren. And so you kind of want to strike that good balance of we don't want to change the view shed. We don't want this to no longer look like a forest. We don't want it to look like a barren hillside. But we also want to be able to get some of the ecosystem services from the forest out of it, right? We want to buffer some of the water. We want to buffer fire effects. And we want to try to, you know, keep fire in the forest and not keep it in our communities. And so really it's, it's this fine line of trying to figure out what's the trajectory that we want and what do we want to do with it? We don't want to see hillsides of dead trees, right? It, it takes a tremendous amount of helicopter logging and hand crews and horse logging to get those trees back down so that they're no longer a hazard. And so, you know, you might think, yeah, we're going to open up terrain, but there's a whole lot of work and a lot of millions of dollars that need to go into, a, in, into effect to really make that a ski run. So um, it's a great question and there's no one answer for that. Each, each area is really kind of formulating a, a different recipe for do we want to protect this area and do we not want to protect that area? Is this in our view shed or is that not? Do we want to try to protect water and ski snowpack in this area and maybe not so much over here? So it's a great question. That's what it's all about. That's what management is. Yeah. Great question. I don't, I kind of skirted the answer because it's, yeah, so many different, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> well, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you guys all so much for making it out here after, you know, a lot of watching these talks on your computer. We really appreciate uh. you being here and <laughs> we're so excited to finally be able to gather together. Um, no, I just want to say thank you. Yep. And keep this going. Yeah. Thank you.